Our monetary system has two major bugs, the zero lower bound of interest rates and the practically free deposit guarantee. But to understand these, we first need to set straight some popular misunderstandings regarding our current banking system as well as money and interest in general. Our current credit money system is terribly misunderstood and unnecessarily demonized. This is largely due to the outdated perception of money as a circulating medium of exchange and debt as borrowed money. Fiat paper money and fractional reserve banking are not descriptive of what we have. Our current monetary system is essentially a system for keeping track of how much people and institutions owe each other in real goods and services. Simply an accounting system for debts and credits. Unlike you might have been taught at school, banks do not lend on their depositors' money to borrowers. They simply grant new credit, and there is nothing wrong with creating credit relations out of nothing, just as there is nothing wrong with creating meters or distance out of nothing. Though the verb create is a bit misleading as you do not usually use it for distance or other relations. Money isn't anything that exists any more than a friendship or age differences are. It's a relation. More a position than a possession. Having money just means that other people owe you goods and services via the bank. The only way the numbers on our bank accounts differ from other kinds of credit, like corporate bonds, is that they carry no credit default risks of private parties as they are guaranteed by the government. Calling a bank's debt to its account holders deposits and newly granted credit loans is certainly misleading. One factor is that there's a great fault in the language that we use, or a great bias in the language that we use in relation to banking. The word deposit is a hangover from the days of the goldsmiths who took bags of gold for safekeeping. And we also speak of banks lending, on mo banks lending money. Banks do not lend money. Loans create deposits. Now, students are all taught that banks lend on deposits, that deposits create the ability to lend and banks respond to that. This is a regression. Currencies, like the US dollar or the euro, are merely accounting units for these credit relations. The word currency is also used to refer to physical cash, notes and coins, but cash is just one way to account for credit on the central bank and we could soon manage without it. The quantity of cash has no magical effects on the economy. As the mental images of money as some kind of substance are very sticky, it might be easier to forget about money and just think about credit. If you insist on defining money as a commodity acting as a medium of exchange, we don't have money now, and a working economy does not need money. Our monetary system is like a big time banking network, except that prices are not tied to hours of work, but to these abstract currency units, and that there is interest, which compensates for credit risks and allows keeping the whole system in balance. And it's very sensible to base money in this way on private liabilities because the value of any money essentially depends on the expectation that others will provide you goods and services for that money, just like the value of any credit you're holding. Therefore, the most stable backup for the value of money is other people's liability to provide things for that money. Debt. Credit money only seems perverse because of our twisted emotional attachments to money and debt and our outdated morals regarding work and saving which make us want to think of money as some kind of real wealth. As money represents purchasing power over goods and services and hence power over other people's labor, activist groups and economists that dream of debt-free money essentially would want people to have power over others but no one to have power over them. Which is a little bit contradictory. On the other hand, Commodity currencies of limited supply like gold or bitcoin are merely constant speculative bubbles. The real interest rate mechanism in such currencies actually works in reverse with a positive self-reinforcing feedback loop. 
Excess saving causes prices to fall, raising its purchasing power, which encourages further saving and hoarding. For an economy to work stably with such a currency, completely ridiculous assumptions would need to apply, such as a constant circulation velocity, which is what the quantity theory of money assumes. Instead, in a credit accounting system like the one we have, the credit market and hence the labor market can be kept in balance with the interest rate. However, there is no automatic market feedback mechanism controlling the interest rate. As said, banks are not lending on any cash from their vaults that could start to run out and force them to raise interest rates when people for example want to spend too much on credit. Nor do interest rates fall automatically when people save too much, that is postpone their spending too much. There is no limit to the amount of credit that banks can grant, and even if such limits were imposed, that still wouldn't guarantee that people want to spend off their savings at the same rate as others want to pay off their debts. That's why we need to have a central bank controlling the risk-free interest rate so that the desired total amounts of held credit and debt are in balance with each other and hence the supply and demand for labor are balanced. And unlike our outdated monetarist and new Keynesian models assume, controlling this interest rate does not have much to do with controlling the amount of money in the market. Essentially, the interest rate determines the reward for holding monetary savings and the cost of being in debt. And these influence the aggregate supply of labor, that is, people's desire to work, and the aggregate demand for labor, determined by the desire to spend and to make real investments. Investing essentially means using work now to make valuable assets that help production in the future. The opportunities available for profitable real investments are determined by expected future consumption, the capital intensity of the technologies available, and the return required for such investments. And that required return is strongly affected by the risk-free interest rate, as we'll explain when discussing the zero lower bound of interest rates, the minimum wage of capital. The aggregate supply and demand for labor are what influence overall pressures to raise or lower wages. And in the absence of sudden changes in labor productivity, nominal labor costs are the main determinant of the overall nominal price level of goods and services, the rise in which is called inflation. In this model, we can see quite clearly why conventional monetary policy, which targets inflation by controlling the overnight interest rate, works so well. But we can also see why so-called quantitative easing, which means the central bank buying large amounts of bonds off the market, is not very effective at increasing demand or inflation pressures. It only swaps one kind of credit for another and doesn't make monetary saving any less tempting or real investments any more profitable.